Good evening. Please welcome Jason Moran. And as I'm sure you know already, Jason is the artistic advisor to the jazz program here at the Kennedy Center. Jason is filling some huge, I won't say big, huge shoes in uh, uh, the, I guess you could say, the godfather of jazz at the Kennedy Center, the late, great Dr. Billy Taylor. Now, Jason, you're, you're from Houston. Right. How did you come to play this music? <laughs> not, not, that, not that Houston was a, was a detriment to your playing this music, <laughs> but how did you come to play this music? Well, you know, Houston is like a blues and R&B and gospel town. And um, I would say that my father had a large record collection. Um, but it kind of comprised like Led Zeppelin, um, Kennedy Center Honor, well, <laughs> Led Zeppelin, <laughs> James Brown, and then you'd have Thelonious Monk or Charlie Parker. So it's just kind of like, you know, really beautiful mix of music. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in the 80s, I was listening to a lot of hip hop. And while I was playing piano, I started playing piano at age six, studying Suzuki, which is quite boring stuff. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, what it puts into the mind is that, that the more you practice, the better you can, you know, the better you can get. Right. And at age, I'll say around 13, I had gotten to the point where I thought that I didn't know if music was actually what I should be doing. Like my friends are outside riding skateboards and bicycles. Why am I in here playing Mozart? It just didn't, wasn't making sense to me. Mm -hmm. And um, but one day I heard a record of my father's. Uh, I walked into their room and they were playing a record by a great pianist named Thelonious Monk. And he was playing the song Round Midnight. And I thought, well, what if I could play like that? What if I, this sounds so good, what if I focus on trying to sound like that? Was it, was it, was it the sense of the fact that he was an improviser? Was that what got you? Well, there's a couple of things going. One is, when I looked at the record cover, he didn't have a powdered wig on, <laughs> you know, like he had a hat, you know, and a nice tie, and, you know, and a coat. And mm -hmm. um, that was intriguing visually. Um, and then there was this sense that the music also was, uh, was loose, that it was open to uh, possibility, you know, and the way I was learning classical music, no one ever talked to me about possibility in classical music. Um, they talked about other things like technique and, dynamics and fingerings. Um, so, but here, Thelonious Monk is offering possibility. And that kind of attracted me. As a, you know, as a kid, boy, going through puberty, like you're looking for possibility. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, <laughs> so, you know that's, that's where I was, you know. It was like the right thing to hear. I mean, also you have to compound the fact that around that same time, Clint Eastwood decided to make his documentary about Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. So here I was, I thought, being so original by finding this, like, rare gem, you know, this recording of Thelonious Monk. Meanwhile, Thelonious Monk is becoming a Hollywood star because mm -hmm. he's on the big screen. Right. And so I could actually take a date to see a Thelonious Monk movie. Like, this was bizarre, <laughs> you know, because all of a sudden he was on the same pedestal as people were putting Michael Jordan or any kind of pop star. So for me, Thelonious Monk became the top of the mountain, and it was something to strive for. And where did you go from there? Well, I mean, I started going to a performing arts high school. I mean, it's a major thing. I mean, it's one thing that I kind of wish for for America is that around all these major cities and small cities is that there are performing arts high schools uh, so that a kid can go study art, they can go study theater, they can go study dance, they can go study music, orchestral, or jazz, you know? So this is where I, what I kind of dove into. And in that, in that instance was the time when I became very aware that I wasn't so crazy to be into Thelonious Monk, and that there were a lot of other crazy people like me <laughs> that also were way invested in trying to perfect their craft, whether it was the drawing of a circle and the and shading. And these were your classmates? And you these were my about? classmates, mm -hmm. you know? And so what happened is, is as I started to work with them, I began to kind of learn more about jazz history 
And so this is from, you know, 1990 to 93 that I was at this school. Now, there's a man at that school. I have to mention him. His name is Bob Morgan. Uh, I've known him for years. Right. Uh, and he's someone who was important to that program at that school. Right. What was the importance of having, uh, I guess you could say, a charismatic educator right. uh, working with you at that stage of your development? Well, you, a young kid always needs somebody to kind of take the ruler and hit you on the hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is kind of what he was. Um, as he knew what to ask for from his students, um, he was encouraging, but also he was encouraging with kind of uh, critique as well. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time he asked me, Jason, do you know how to play How High the Moon? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. And so I played it. And he said, man, you sound like Liberace. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is that good? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that, you know? <laughs> That didn't matter to me, but uh, because I was doing all these kind of like runs and glissandi, but uh, you know, but he, he had a really a way of kind of also saying, oh, you know what I think you like, you know, you should listen to Bill Evans, or you know, he would suggest things for other students to listen to, mm -hmm. but he suggested different things to different students. So most of the students were getting kind of a broad base of the music, and then we would all confer, you know, in the practice room and say, oh, you know what I was checking out, I was checking out Stanley Turrentine playing the song Sugar. Oh, do you know that? No. Okay, well, let's learn it. And then, so it was, you know, he, he knew just what to drop into our minds, and then we would kind of get with our buddies and then try to figure out what he was actually meant. So, so you went through this uh, high school with the performing arts, and at what point did the light go on and you said, gee, this is something I want to pursue uh, for my life's work? Hmm. I mean, honestly, I might say that I didn't really commit my mind to it until mm -hmm. maybe after my second record for Blue Note Records. Mm -hmm. Like, I really didn't, because my parents aren't artists, so they didn't live the lifestyle where you kind of really go day, day by day and you make your own schedule and you create your own work. My mother was an educator, my father was an investment banker, and so they, you know, they really had a a shtick that they did every day. Um, mm -hmm. A shtick. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a tradition, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't know how to kind of be free and make your own schedule. Mm -hmm. So I was, even as I was in the practice of being a musician and making recordings and actually touring, did I not, I didn't understand actually what I was doing. I was just following the road mm -hmm. without ever really understanding what the history was that was attached to it or how I was going to play a part of this history. And so I never really knew. I just kept following it because there was so much to, there was so much to learn about the path in music. There was so much, oh, I just got to this corner and here's this split in the road and which way can I go? And you actually can go down one road and then track, backtrack and say, well, now let me take this road. You can not only do that within the music at any given moment, but you can do that in the study as well. So I just kept finding all these different avenues to try to study in, and it never got old, you know? I mean, even there was a point when I was at Manhattan School of Music, when I moved from Texas up to New York to go to Manhattan School of Music, during my junior year, I actually confessed to my friends, I don't know if I'm really cut out to do this. I don't really know if I'm supposed to be a musician, because it just wasn't making sense. So I was, when, did you, when did you have that epiphany that, yes, this is what I'm supposed to be doing? I think, I think when my, my now wife said, oh, you know, you sound really good. <laughs> <laughs> Not that she didn't say that before, but, you know, but I think like the few times when I actually moved her with music, mm -hmm. like I think then you become aware of that power. I mean, it's, and you know what, unfortunately in conservatories, they never really talk to you about the power of music. They tell you how to make it, but they don't tell you the power it has, you know. Mm -hmm how it can really kind of change a person's life or lifestyle, um, the kind of new, new kind of doors it opens in people's imaginations. Uh, like great art does this across discipline. Um, so nobody ever talked to me about that, you know? And I felt like, you know, like sometimes I would play a song and I'd say, you know, I'm gonna play this like for my grandfather. I'm gonna play this Duke Ellington piece. Like say I play this Duke Ellington piece called, uh, it's a beautiful piece called, uh, 
single petal of a rose. Like I remember playing this like for my grandmother after she had passed away. Like it had never like struck me as a as a song that I would play for her. Mm -hmm. But like one year I went home to Texas to play and I started and I said, this is for her, you know. Duke Ellington, single petal of a rose. So you played that for your grandmother. Right. What did she say? Well, she had passed away. Oh, okay. So it was for all of my like relatives that were in the audience. Like okay. I wasn't able to go to her. Well, actually, I was at her funeral. Mm -hmm. But I didn't play at her funeral. Mm -hmm. Because it's a very difficult thing to be a performer and then like then play for someone who you were so dear to, you yeah. know, like then, okay, now perform in this extremely tense situation. So I played that kind of after the fact, and I knew which notes were making my aunt cry. Mm -hmm. Like, like I've, it became very real then, that music is not, it's more than notes, it's, uh, it's emotion, it's all of these other things that could not be summed up, you know, in text. They could be summed up in kind of feeling. Well, I'm gathering that um, although you did say that your parents, your mother's an educator, your father's a banker, um, I'm gathering that your parents were very supportive and nurturing of your endeavors in this regard. Correct. I like to say that they kept my brothers and I off of the street, you know, through kind of having a lot of activities, whether it was playing tennis or golf or basketball or taking piano. You know, they really kept us active in, in the in our in our neighborhood, and also they took us to see you know, er, you know when Wynton Marsalis was becoming famous in the '80s, like so he came to Houston, so we all shuttled off to see Wynton. Mm -hmm. Or if Andre Watts came to play with the orchestra with the Houston Symphony Orchestra, we went to see Andre Watts. If Alvin Ailey came to town, we went to see Alvin Ailey. If Jean Michel Basquiat's exhibition came to, to Houston, we all went to see that together. So it was like we had these kind of cultural outings, mm -hmm. my brothers and I. I have two older brothers and I'm a middle child. I think middle, I think people should know like that I'm a middle child because I guess it's supposed to mean something about my personality. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, but you know, that, that is a thing, like middle, middle kids, single kids, anyway. Mm -hmm. So they were supportive, you know. There was this moment while I was at Manhattan School of Music, I remember being home one summer and you know, as nosy kids do, I'm sure people who have kids know that kids get nosy. So I was being nosy in my parents' <laughs> bedroom and I found this videotape. And so I put this videotape in the video recorder and I started watching it. And in it was a conversation my parents were having with each other, just like a camera sitting on a, a table 
and they were just both having a conversation. And they were having a conversation about my brothers and I and what we were up to. And there was a point where in this tape, it got to, so what do you think Jason is going to do with this being up at Manhattan School of Music? And I just pressed stop. Oh, you didn't want to hear the results? I did not want to okay. know what they thought. Mm -hmm. Because I, I just was frightened. I was terrified at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I thought, huh, well, I have a lot of study to do. That's what I know I'm supposed to do. So mm -hmm. let me just continue diving into this music. And that's, you know, that has kept me on a path. So you went to Manhattan School of Music, and uh, you had this kind of epiphany that, oh, OK, I will be a professional musician. So how did you plot that course? I mean, I might say, <laughs> honestly, I might say it's all of, uh, this, what's the saying? Someone else will have to correct me about preparation mm -hmm. versus luck, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and during the time I was at Manhattan School of Music, I was studying with a great, great, great pianist named Jackie Bayard, mm -hmm. who played for many years with a great, great bassist and composer, Charles Mingus. And he was the single reason why I went to Manhattan School of Music, because he was on faculty there. And so here I was, this kid, studying with this master of the piano. And every Monday, we would have these hour-long lessons, and he just kept just giving me these musical vitamins, you know? So take this, take this, take this, take this. And by the end of my years at Manhattan School of Music, I had a lot of information, but I wasn't sure how or where it was going to come out. And then I started to be, given, to be given these opportunities. And the first opportunity was with a saxophonist named Greg Osby, who literally had never heard me play, ever. It was on a recommendation by a great friend, a drummer, who said, you should hire my friend Jason for this three-week tour in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so Greg Osby is quite trusting of the musicians he works with. And so we just talk on the phone. My audition literally was talking on the phone. Really? For three hours, we talked on the phone about everything, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, you're hired. Wow. I had a passport, luckily. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to Europe for three weeks. And, you know, and that's really when I started to gain kind of confidence. I said, oh, okay, well, okay, so this is a musician who goes to Vienna for the first time. It was my first gig was in Vienna, playing in this club. And I literally played in this club. At the end of the gig, Greg doesn't really tell me how I sound. He just mm -hmm. gives me, like... I don't know, four or five hundred dollars, and I go to my bedroom and I get in my room and like, you know, like, I'm like just crazy, like, oh, I'm in Europe. I have some money in my hand. <laughs> Are people having sex next door to me? Like, this is, <laughs> like, I hear this. It was like kind of odd, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's really odd. But the next, and then the next day just kind of kept going, and mm -hmm. I just really kind of continued to follow that because it never. It just kind of started to, to uh, snowball after that. Well, you mentioned Mozart, and you played some Ellington for us, which you played for your grandmother, in, in honor of your grandmother. Uh, and you studied with Jackie Byard. And the one thing that we know about Jackie Byard is that he had this broad conception of music. Right. Literally from what I refer to as the ancient to the future. Oh, right. And it's clear in your playing and your music that you have a broad conception. Right. Because I know that you have, you have done projects related to uh, the great Fats Waller, who goes way, way back in jazz history. But then you've also embraced hip hop because you are part of, I guess you could say, maybe the second, genera second hip hop generation. Mm, right. uh, how do you go about bringing all of those kinds of elements into your own music and creating your own thing? Well, I try, one thing is I try not to think of it as, as something that is mine because I also know kind of where all the roots are. So mm -hmm. like, it's Jackie Bayard combined with Africa Bambata, the you know, hip hop icon, you know? Mm -hmm. So these two people meet, what do they sound like together? I try to think of myself more as like, like a computer that you just give these two different factors and you see what actually happens if you Or maybe a tour up. guide. A tour guide, interesting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you kind of can look at music history in this way. Um, mm -hmm. 
And one thing about music history is that music history is what you learn in school, right? Or art history or dance history or whatever, movement history. But I try to think about music history as something that's very personal. You know, I mean, I think we all have kind of like people have their wedding songs. Like, you know, my wedding song was Nina Simone's uh, I'm Feeling Good, you know. No, birds flying high, you know how I feel, you know. Like, like I remember hearing that song that day. Or people always have these places and how they hear songs or what situations they were in when they heard this sound, you know? And I try to think of the, how I perform music that, that I should be able to take people not only through kind of like, yeah, like through a tour of like the music histories that have affected me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, to try to give light to say a Fats Waller. Fats Waller is not a name that's uttered every day, but for me he's such a kind of seminal part of how I play the piano uh, that I think is important to kind of not only educate, but then also to distort Fat Swaller as well, you know? Like, uh, uh, I, I'll do a brief example. There's a song that he, I mean, later in April of next year, we're gonna do it, actually in this room, very room, we're gonna do a dance party of Fat Swaller's music. This is gonna be pretty crazy, but, <laughs> but in it, I've taken all this Fat Swaller music and decided to try to make it dance and, and to try to extract small elements out of what Fat Swaller is playing and then apply them to, to dance beats. So Fats is quite, quite virtuosic. We'll play things like. interesting to, to, to hear you uh, playing the music of these masters and, and realizing that, that you have such a broad uh, conception and such a grasp on all these different styles of music. I mean, you're talking about playing Fats Waller and Duke Ellington, and you talk about touring with Greg Osby, who is a, a decided modernist. So, I mean, it's obvious that you've embraced a, a, a large chunk of the tradition. And when I think of Billy Taylor, mm. he was also someone who had this broad sense of this music and, and a real openness right. to all these different styles of, j of jazz. Right. So when the opportunity was presented to you to do this program at the Kennedy Center and to be the artistic advisor, what was your sense of that? And what was your sense of what Billy Taylor's legacy was here and, 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 and what you might do? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, Billy and I had uh, pianists. Like, we had a relationship as pianists, like mm -hmm. first and foremost. Uh, I saw Billy Taylor at that high school I was at, attending in Houston. Billy Taylor came and gave a master class when I was maybe 16 years old. And I stood back then with video cameras were like over the arm, like over the <laughs> shoulder. Like I stood with the video camera and videotape. Right. Billy Taylor give this master class. And it was exactly that. It was how he was able to display all the various histories of jazz. Mm -hmm. Like one person, one single person was able to understand and really inhabit those ideas of these different generations, you know, and be in the middle of it also. Um, and so I think when I received this phone call about, about this opportunity, I more thought of like, kind of like, okay, the conversations Billy Taylor and I would have were about like, are you making people dance, you know? Are people listening to your music, Jason? You know, uh, you know, like all kinds of like really, really getting into me. You know, like a, like a great mentor does. They really kind of like dive into you. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, considering how much he's done not only here at the Kennedy Center but also for the music at large, like for many years being like the public face on national television on CBS Sunday Morning, kind of you know showcasing young and emerging talent or talent that has been around for a long time, making sure the American public knew about it, this was like, oh, what a fixture, you know? Also making sure, like, creating Jazzmobile, that the music gets out into the community, you know? Um, so how, I thought, well, this is an honor to even be kind of asked to, to, to continue his, his role here, mm -hmm. um, and also a challenge about how the role can shift as well. So how to honor the musicians who are still here. So many great musicians who have kind of been a part of the kind of like seminal years of jazz history are still playing unbelievable music. We cannot go hear Mozart play a concert tonight. He is not around. Mm -hmm. Roy Haynes playing drums is still around, you know? He is an icon and a treasure. So how to continue to make these homes for these great musicians that they can come, still come uh, display like, the work which is so kind of important to American history. You know, so I thought like all this opportunity, all these great musicians that I'm aware of that, you know, would love a, a chance to play and how to continue like to give them opportunities, you know, and then continue to also collaborate not only with DC musicians, but DC institutions as well, you know. And so it just was more of like, this is um, kind of like, it was something I would have never ever anticipated, but the, the opportunity and the possibility is something that I totally am kind of trying to get a grasp on right now because it's enormous. Well, you know, I remember <clears throat> some months ago when you first, uh, not long after you first uh, uh, took on this, this huge task here at the Kennedy Center, I ran into you on the train on the way to New York, and I was asking you, you know, what were your plans? What were you going to do here at the Kennedy Center? What kind of programs were you interested in bringing? And uh, you, you told me very calculatedly, and, but very excitedly, about these different ideas that you had that you wanted to bring here. And I remember one of the things you talked about, several of the things you talked about have just recently been realized. Mm. Uh, you talked about this whole idea of, uh, we always talk about, as presenters, we always talk about bringing a younger audience into our spaces. Not that we want to dismiss the audience that is already there and has supported the music. Not that we want to dismiss the older audience like myself, because I'm not to be dismissed, and, and <laughs> neither are the people in this room. We, we still need to bring programs for this audience in this room. But you talked about the idea of refreshing the audience, and you wanted to do some things that attracted a different sort of audience to the Kennedy Center. And a, a couple of weeks ago, you had a program in this very space uh, where you kind of transformed this space into what was referred to as the supersized Kennedy Center Jazz Club. Right. What was that whole idea? As I travel around, I see a lot of music in a lot of various spaces, whether it's in performance art contexts or whether it's in 
rock contexts or jazz contexts. And the possibility is actually that the music can happen anywhere, mm -hmm. you know, and people can experience it in different ways. Uh, many jazz clubs in Europe, what they'll do is they'll have a show and people will come sit and enjoy the show. And after the show, they'll clear all the tables away and an entirely new group of people will come in to dance all night long mm -hmm. to a DJ. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a totally different, but the same space is used for multiple uses within a matter of hours. Um, and I thought that it would be nice because some bands that perform necess don't necessarily want you to sit down. They want you to stand up. Mm -hmm. uh, they're accustomed to it. They want you to be closer to them. They want you, you they want to feel the energy of two or three hundred people standing within 20 feet of them. They want to feel that. And, uh, and to try to make spaces for, a space for those musicians, you know. So we had a group in here called Modesky, Martin & Wood, which has built their history off of getting in a van and going across America and playing concerts for kids who, you know, college kids who like to have a beer or two and come and stand and listen to an instrumental trio, play some music. With the emphasis on standing. On the, with the emphasis on standing right. and congregating. Mm -hmm. While the music is happening, it's social that you can have a conversation. Now I mean, that's not necessarily for us in this room. So we're no, not but you know, but in the great, the great gig, part okay? about, about the, the audience here is that many people from this room were there too. Mm -hmm. You know, is mm -hmm. that they were like curious, oh, well, how is this? And you know, a few people approached me and said, you know, Jason, this is not working. <laughs> and I said, I'm glad you're telling me this because I do want to know. I said, but you know, it's meaning it's not working for them. For them. And I said, right. but you see those 300 kids standing up there? It's working for them. For them is, and he said, oh, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he stayed the entire night, he and his wife, and they, he came to me at the end of the show. He said, you know, Jason, I was a little strong at first when I approached <laughs> you and said I didn't like this. He said, but I understand what you're trying to do. And that, you know, that was more, is that people give it a, give it a try because the musicians are ready to kind of also try the music in a different way too. And then last night, uh, for those of you who weren't here, uh, the Kennedy Center had an election night program on the Millennium stage. And I remember you talked about that quite vividly. You wanted to have a situation here at the Kennedy Center where people could come and hear some music in a relaxed mode and have a big screen with the, uh, the returns and the election results. Right. Now, how did that work out? <laughs> how did it work out? I don't know. I mean, you know, what was beautiful was we, we kind of had a mix of, of repertoire which used old campaign songs from, you know, hundreds of years of history of campaign, American presidential campaign songs. Yeah, he did play Happy Days Are Here Again. <laughs> Happy Days Are Here Again, that. yeah. <laughs> Bridge Over Troubled Water, you know, right. like, You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet, George mm -hmm. Bush's thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Like all these interesting kind of like parallels between these presidents who choose songs that they think mirror their personalities. Mm -hmm. Crazy was Ross Perot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yes, that was Ross Perot's yeah, theme song. So, you know, it was, and we combined it with a, uh, there was a bunch of bluegrass musicians who were there. There was uh, singers, and there was uh, there were two horn players from D.C. So the the audience was to I mean the the band was totally um, kind of amorphous at times. People shuffling in and out, and for the three hours it was amazing. For I can't imagine for an audience who was listening to the music and also watching the results come in on the election screen. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a tense evening, and uh, <laughs> but I think um, anyway, yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> And you did, you, 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 you also mentioned a program which is coming up this Sunday, right. uh, which is the whole aspect of combining jazz or creative music and comedy. Right. Talk about that idea. Well, I think it goes back to the early era of vaudeville performers uh, and then in the mid 20th century when musicians and like Richard Pryor and Miles Davis are on the same stage. Even say Betty Carter would share the stage with Jimmy J.J. Walker from mm -hmm. Good Times. Uh, so there was a lot of this uh, kind of combining of forms. Uh, yeah, I know Lenny Bruce used to do things in jazz clubs too. Yeah. Right, Woody Allen would be at the Village Vanguard in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was to put these kind of forms back together where there's music and, you know, but it's is that the music is not serious this time. It's actually people, I mean, I enjoy going to comedy clubs a lot, so this was part of, this is part of the, the, the reason to do that. So what's that evening gonna be like this coming Sunday? 
it remains to be seen. <laughs> you know, I think people who like to laugh and are, you know, you know, are a little bit relaxed about subject matter mm -hmm. should definitely come, you know, because, uh, I mean, these are comedians and they really poke fun at reality. So this is, this is what I, I'm looking, David Allen Greer is, uh, is our host for the evening. He was recently in Porgy and Bess mm -hmm. singing the role of help, sport and life, singing right, sport right. and life. So David Allen Greer is a great comedian and singer, so it should be a very interesting evening. Now, I, I, you know, I can't let you get away without having you tell us about your work with your, your wife. Right. Because your wife is also an opera singer. Right. So talk about life around the Moran household with a, a piano player, uh, artistic advisor to the Kennedy Center, uh, a band leader, and an opera singer. Well, it's quite, uh, it's, it's challenging at times because there's a <laughs> lot of noise. Um, I mean, you have twin boys that like make a lot of noise on their own, but in, what it really is is that people, I mean, my wife and I only get ideas out of hearing each other really test work out. So it kind of is all, a constant state of uh, musical agitation in the household as we were trying to make things work. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also extremely inspiring to work with one other person who is kind of, we've watched each other grow artistically over the past 18 years, like, or however long we've been together, but many mm -hmm. years together, yeah. Yeah, I had a writer tell me that uh, he interviewed you recently, but that he got a lot of great stuff from your wife. Yeah. So your well, wife is obviously an outspoken advocate as well, right? I mean, any good partner in any situation, I'm her best advocate as well. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh. So you want to play something for us before we, before we stop? <laughs> sure, I'll play uh, one more piece of music. This is a piece of music called uh, To Bob Vattel of Paris, okay. written by my teacher, Jackie Bayard. All right. Thank you. 